Hey everyone, welcome to this week's Azure Infrastructure Update. It is the 27th of June, and obviously I'm not in my regular space. Once again, I'm in my little temporary studio. I'm in a hotel room in Coeur d'Alene in Idaho, and Coeur d'Alene is phenomenal. It's an amazing place. I am doing the Ironman Coeur d'Alene, actually probably as you're watching this on Sunday, and my number is 1087 if you want to check on and see how I'm suffering. I have changed the mobile setup a little bit this time. I got myself a little Razer um, laptop and a little Yeti microphone just to try and improve the audio, but there may be some background noise, not a huge amount I can do. So let's get on with the updates. So new videos, I did kind of a deep dive all about highly available network virtual appliances actually in Azure. There's a whole set of considerations, so I, I go through those in this video. And then I really explored the Microsoft graphs. If you think about Azure AD management or Teams or Exchange Online or SharePoint Online or any of those things, the Microsoft graph is really the direction we're going now for all of that management. So I kind of show how to get started with graph, what scopes are, and then actually interacting with PowerShell. From a new features perspective on compute, so the FX series VMs have gone GA. So this is the extreme computing SKU. They're using the second gen Intel Xeon scalable processors. And the whole point of these is I can now have a single core going up to 4.1 gigahertz with a base of 3.4. I have 21 gigabytes of memory per virtual CPU. So that's a huge ratio of kind of one to 21 um, virtual CPUs to memory. I can have up to a terabyte total memory for the biggest SKUs with 48 virtual CPUs. And I can get them in four, 12, 24, 36, and 48 core SKUs. It's local SSD. And where these are being aimed at is where I have some workload that maybe isn't multi-threaded all the time. Maybe it really needs some really powerful single-threaded operations. Things like electronic design automation, EDA, where I'm rendering and designing circuits, they would benefit from this type of virtual machine. So these are now GA and available in a number of regions. You can go and kind of check out the details kind of for those different virtual machines over here. And here we can see the detail of exactly, yeah, number of virtual CPUs available, and then the memory that goes along with those. So those are now GA. So jumping back over, also then we have uh, the Azure Container Registry is now available in West US 3. Remember West US 3 recently went live. So more and more services. It started off with a huge number of services. It has AZs, but now the Azure Container Registry is also available in West US 3, either as the sole copy or with kind of the premium SKUs, I can have copies of that repo. On the networking side, really the, the only one here is the Azure Web App Firewall now has a 2.0 default rule set in preview. Now this is only available with Azure Front Door Premium SKU. And this new rule set is made up of 17 different rule groups and I can still add or override my own rules, but it has a new mode. So I can actually now have anomaly scoring so based on the anomaly, I could kind of think from, hey, it's just a notice all the way through warning, error to critical. Well, it will only take action if the total anomaly score is five points or above. So I could have like a, a notice or a warning and it wouldn't actually trigger it to fire. Uh, this is instead of the traditional mode. And all of these things are including things like the Microsoft Threat Intelligence, giving additional coverage, patches for different vulnerabilities. So this is now available. We can actually again jump over and we can kind of see, well, this is kind of the, the old default rule set. We've got the anomaly scoring mode, and then you have this 2.0, so 17 rule groups, and it's got all these different groupings of types of protection. So that is now available over in preview. Next up, storage, and actually quite a lot of things on storage. I did a video a few weeks ago all about managed disks, and I talked about bursting. So for premium SSDs, 
if they're smaller than a certain size, I think it was a P30, could be wrong on that. I get a bucket and that bucket for up to 30 minutes, I can burst to a higher IOPS, a higher throughput based on, I start with a full bucket, but then I can accrue if I use under my provisioned IOPS. So now that same 30 minute accrual based bucket to burst above my provisioned amount is now available for standard SSD as well. So this is only E30 and smaller. And once again, if we go and check this out, it shows us kind of, hey, we have up to 500 IOPS, up to 60 megabytes per second. Then we have this max burst number for both the throughput and we have it for the IOPS. And that is only available, as you can see here, for the E30 and below. The bigger disks do not have that on-demand kind of bucket-based, so like the, the bucket-based bursting available. So now standard SSDs, uh, we have that as well. Azure Blob NFS. Now 3.0 support has gone geo. So this is the ability to use the NFS3 protocol just over regular object storage. There's no gateways, there's no data copying. I can still use the regular APIs, but now I can use NFS as well. So typically Linux machines, for example, would benefit from this. Now the storage account I use has to be data lake gen two. I, I checked that box for the hierarchical namespace option. And then that gives me the true folders, POSIX style, ACLs, etc. So this will sit on top of the ADLS Gen 2. An important point, there are no file type ACLs today enforced through the NFS3. The control is through the network. So you need to be able to control who is actually connecting to that storage account. So I could use things like maybe private endpoints or service endpoints restricted to certain subnets. But that's how I actually will control who can use this NFS3? There were no file level restrictions today. ADLS Gen 1 is gonna be blocked from 5th of July. I mean, really should be using it anyway. Gen 2 is better in pretty much every single way. And it will be retired on the 29th of February, 2024. Basically, I don't think anyone's using it anyway, really now, but you can't create new ones in a week's time. Azure NetApp Files are introducing a regional quota of 25 tebibytes. Remember, it's the TIB, so it's tebi instead of terra, because it's 1024 to the power of whatever. There didn't used to be any kind of capacity limit put in place. This has really been introduced with the idea of making sure there's going to be sufficient capacity when you go and create these volumes. Now, if you're already using it, if I'm using less than 20 terabytes today, then that's what the limit will be set to, 25 te tebibytes. If I'm using more than 20 tebibytes, then it will actually set that limit to 10% above what you've currently provisioned. You still only get billed for what you've actually provisioned, but this is now in place. You can go and request increase if you need it, but they're introducing this um, default regional quota. Again, it's per region of this 25 tebibytes. On the database side, so Postgres Flexible Server now has a forced failover. With Flexible Server, remember this is the VM-based option. So I can use burstable VMs, I can stop and start the compute. I can optionally have a replica. Now with this replica, I get synchronous streaming replication and auto failover. So what this capability will let me do is actually test that failover experience. I can force a failover, actually make it over, see how my app behaves, do that kind of testing. PostgreSQL Hyperscale now has server group restarts. Remember, Hyperscale uses the Postgres Citus, the Citus add-on. And what that means is now it shards the data. Instead of being a single instance, it shards the data over multiple instances. So I have multiple servers. So what this is now gonna let me do is I can actually force a complete restart of all of the servers in that group. Now, obviously, if I restart all the servers, there's gonna be some downtime. So you will be notified of that when you do it. But I can now um, force a server group restart. Cosmos DB now has this full text query diagnostic option. And this might be easier if we just quickly look at this. If I jump over for a second, 
if we think about Cosmos DB, we, we get logging data. But sometimes it might be hard to understand, well, what query calls this? What can I do? So now we have this diagnostics full text query I can turn on. And what that's going to do is now show me the deobfuscated query. I, I can see the full text of the query, which should make it easier to identify um, kind of the other performance usage optimizations that you're doing, make it easier to kind of work out what's going on. For with that, that works with the core SQL API, the API for MongoDB, Gremlin. Uh, but remember, it is now doing some extra data, so there'd be some extra logging, uh, maybe some extra costs. So just be aware of that. Azure SQL had a number of updates. So from a GA perspective, they introduced parallel backup for SQL managed instance general purpose SKU. Remember, with SQL, I have kind of this compute and storage. And the backup is this long running process typically. It sequentially backs up this file. Once that's finished, it goes to this file and so on. So we think about that storage is a disk. Well, that disk has certain characteristics. It has certain performance. So using this sequential method, one disk at a time, it just hammers that disk and it can only go as fast as that disk can handle it. Well, with each database file on its own disk, with the parallel option, now instead of maxing out one disk, multiple files are actually going to be backed up at the same time. So this reduces the overall time of the backup and also because now many files over many disks are backed up at the same time, well the impact is now actually distributed over multiple disks, minimizing the impact on any one disk, which again lessens the chance of any kind of conflict against the actual workload. In preview, now Azure AD only all for Azure SQL Database and SQL MI, i.e. I can turn off SQL authentication. This could be no SQL or for SQL logins, users, nor SQL Server admin, no SQL credentials. I could still create them, they just won't get used. So now I can do Azure AD for everything. On the hyperscale in preview, they introduced the idea of this new type of secondary name replicas. So with hyperscale, we have this primary read write compute query engine instance, and I can have additional secondaries. And then we have these page servers that host the actual data and they scale out. That's what gives us this huge scale. So what I can now have those secondary replicas, there are three types. So I have the HA replica that uses the same pages as the primaries. There's no data copying and they're hot standby. They're designed for failover with automatic failover capability as required. But now I can have a named replica. So a named replica like the HA option, it uses the same pages, those same page servers. There's no data copying, but it's going to appear as a regular read only SQL database in the portal from the API. I can have a different database name from the primary has to be the same region because again remember it's sharing those page servers but each primary can have up to 30 of these named replicas and the goal of this is just to support massive uh, OLTP i.e. kind of regular transactions but also it can support things like um, hybrid transactional and analytical processing HTAP that's where both regular transactions and analytics are performed against the same database and the third type is GeoReplica. And that's in preview. That can be the same or different region, completely different logical server, same name as the primary, but it's complete data copy for DR. And then SQL MI general purpose now can be created or updated to support 16 terabytes up from the current eight terabyte limit. And then miscellaneous. So Azure Key Vault managed HSM has gone GA. So Key Vault is normally the answer to any, where do I store this secret? Where do I put this key? Managed HSM is essentially a dedicated HSM partition. Think your own security world. It has confidential compute enclaves and a managed HSM gets you FIPS 140-2 level three support. They're level three validated HSMs. Regular Key Vault is 140-2 level two. But it is 
HSM protected keys only. There's no software protected keys. There's no secrets in this. It's all about HSM keys. Log Analytics now has an open in Excel function as gone in GA. So we're looking at our logs. I can now open in Excel. I can refresh it. Windows 11 was announced. So obviously Windows 10 was gonna be the last version of Windows. Well, nothing is last forever. You may have seen kind of the event around this. It has a whole new refreshed visuals, a new snapping experience. Uh, a new gaming experience, a new Microsoft Store with Android apps actually now will run on the Windows 11. That's actually being powered by the Amazon App Store. Who knew? Uh, native Teams. Already there was a Teams feature, so you could kind of just talk to friends, family, uh, unlimited kind of communications with those. One of the changes will be it will only have a feature update once a year. So currently Windows 10 has two feature updates. This will only have one it will still have the monthly cumulative update. There is actually a tool you can go to now to test. So if you go to the announcement and the links are in the description, if you keep scrolling through, it goes through kind of all the new features. But you can actually run a test now to see, hey, I can do the PC Health app to check, hey, is this gonna work? And if I fire that up quickly, so let's have a quick look at the PC Health update. So if I show this, there's actually a check now option for Windows 11. And if I click that, great news, I can run Windows 11. So you can go and check now. Pretty much if it runs Windows 10, you should be fine, but you can always go and be doubly sure. Windows Server 2022 Azure edition is now in preview. So remember there's an Azure edition of 2019 and this only runs on Azure an Azure Stack HCI. It won't run on Hyper-V, it won't run on bare metal, it won't run in other clouds. The big thing for 29 is it supported hot patching. Ordinarily, we have to kind of reboot for certain types of updates. This can do it without a reboot. Now, instead of a monthly reboot, maybe I just have a quarterly reboot. For 2022 version, it adds a lot of new 2022 features like TLS 1.3, secured core, 48 terabytes of RAM, 64 sockets, 2048 logical procs. For the Azure edition uniquely, it adds SMB over QUIC. So QUIC is an IETF standard and it basically replaces TCP with a web orientated UDP. So this gives me improved performance, reduces con congestion. It's always encrypted using TLS 1.3 with certificate auth. And then it also gives me this Azure extended network basically lets me have VMs running in Azure and then VMs running on Azure Stack HCI and it encapsulates the layer two ethernet in layer four UDP leveraging VXLAN. So I can essentially extend that between my on-prem and Azure. There's a new version of RDC man. If you use RDC man, they actually have a new version out. Um, again, link in the description. And there's a new cert they announced the AZ700, this is an Azure networking exam. I think it comes out in July in beta, so you can go and take that. Again, the link will have all the documentation about what's gonna be in it. And then there is now documentation. If you are using Azure MFA server, really wanna get away from that and use Azure MFA, there's again documentation now on actually how you can go about doing that migration. And that was it. So I hope that was helpful as always, again, be back to normal next week in my home environment, hopefully walking. Um, it's supposed to be 99 degrees on Sunday, so that's going to be hideous. But until next week, everyone take care.